Solomon said that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, it is the glory of kings to search it out. In the book of Revelation, it talks about priests and kings, referring back to Exodus 19. We are offered, if we would keep his commandments, to be priests and kings. And so it is the glory of these priests and kings to search it out. We have with us Nehemiah Gordon back with us, and we are searching out some of the greatest treasures that have been hidden. Some of these things hidden by God to preserve it for this day and time, and these are the things being revealed. Uh, good to have you back with us this Great week. Great to be back, Michael. You know, some things are sometimes hidden in plain sight. So, so we, we were talking last time about this uh, coin that was produced by King, uh, King of Denmark. Ironically, his name was Christian IV. And <laughs> Christian IV of Denmark uh, produced these coins that had Yehovah with the full vowels in Hebrew, uh, produced in the 1640s. And uh, on the coin, he also has the phrase Justus Judex, which is a Latin phrase, which in, translates from the Hebrew Shofet Tzedek. And that comes from a verse in the Bible that he, or number of verses, but one of them, for example, is Jeremiah 11.20. It says, Vayehovah Tzvaot Shofet Tzedek. Yehovah of hosts is the righteous judge. Oh. And so you know, why did this king put Yehovah's name on a coin? And, and, and this has to do with the context that was going on at that time in Europe. This was the time of, the, um, of these great wars that were happening in Europe, these wars between the Protestants and the Catholics. And the Protestants in particular wanted to say God's on our side. And of course the Catholics said the same thing. And when the Catholics would express that, one of the ways they would do that was through art. And they would say, oh, God's on our side. Let's make a uh, ceiling with God as an old man with a white beard, you know, who's touching Adam, right? You know, was, in other words, the, they used art and they were representing Yehovah through, um, as a man, right? Because that was their artistic tradition. And the mm -hmm. Protestants, uh, Protestants said, well, wait a minute, that's forbidden. And why is it forbidden? Because it says in Deuteronomy, you didn't see a man in the day of the, of the, of the congregation, meaning the day of the revelation of Sinai, and the Protestants said, Protestants said that we're gonna take that literally and not make an image of the Father. And so instead they represented Yehovah by his name. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is recently a friend went and visited the, Bible, the, the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. and they have there on display a page from the original 1611 King James Version. And I actually wanna say it's from the 1613 reprint but uh, I don't remember the exact details, but it's from one of the early versions of the King James, and it, and it has this image of, of the biblical world, essentially, and at the top is, in the cloud, Yehovah with the full vowels. So you're seeing this in books, you're seeing it on coins, you're seeing it in all kinds of different places, in churches in a lot of places. We, we talked about mm -hmm. that in the Karite Files. All over you're seeing Yehovah's name in Europe at this time, and part of the reason is because of the struggle between the Catholic, Catholics and the Protestants. So we mentioned this coin uh, made by Christian IV of Denmark. And one of the things I wanted for years is to actually have one of these coins. When I was younger, Michael, I was kind of a coin nerd. I collected mm. coins. Um, well, this was well beyond my, my means to have a coin like this. But what I decided to do is contact a mint in Utah and have them make a replica of the coin with the front based on the coins from the 1640s of the King of Denmark where it says Yehovah, uh, and in the back, the verse from Malachi, my name is great among the nations. Let me read that verse in its context, Michael, because the verse there in Malachi starts in verse five. I mean, it starts before that, right? But verse five is, is a key mm -hmm. verse in this context. It says, and your eyes will see, and here he's speaking to the Jews, and you will say, Yigdal Yehovah me'al gvul Yisrael. Yehovah has been magnified beyond the borders of Israel. Meaning at that time, they were in this little province of Judah and they had a very provincial attitude. And they said, well, you know, God is our, Yehovah is our God and the Egyptians have their God and the Moabites have their God and the Phoenicians have their God. And Malachi is coming to them and saying, no, this isn't just your God. He's the God who appeared to your ancestors at Mount Sinai, but he didn't appear to your ancestors just for you. And like you said, the right. kingdom of nation of priests, the Mechet Kohanim Vagoy Kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The purpose of Israel from the very beginning, as Jews understand it, was to be that light to the nations. 
uh, to spread the glory of Yehovah's name. That was our mandate. It wasn't for us. It was to bring this message to the world, which we didn't always do such a good job of doing. Um, in verse 11, he then has the, uh, the verse which we quoted before in the last episode, for the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, my name is great among the nations, for my name is great among the nations, says Yehovah of hosts. And there's a little passage in the middle there, Michael, where he says, um, in every place, incense is burned to my name and, uh, and a pure offering. And, and that's really interesting because because my, my, my Jewish um, uh, um, legalism, and I'm gonna call it that, looks at this verse and says, what's Malachi talking about? The only place in the world you're allowed to bring incense is at the temple in Jerusalem. And how do I know that? Because it says it in Exodus, right? Or at the time it was the tabernacle, later it became the temple. It says it in Exodus. We understand it from Leviticus, from Deuteronomy. You can only bring offerings at the place where Yehovah put his name forever. Mm -hmm. And that's not a church in Iceland. That is not um, some place where they're honoring Yehovah's name uh, in, in Germany, in Denmark. And, and, and I, I read this verse and I say, Malachi, rebuke the, the Gentiles who are bringing incense, who are doing things that are contrary to the Torah. But then I realize, wait, this is God's word. And here's my take on this, Michael. Malachi is talking here about God's name is great among the nations, and maybe the nations don't always get it right to the letter of the Torah but they're doing the best they can with what they have in their cultural context and they're receiving Yehovah's name and glorifying his name. And that is something that will draw them to the Torah. That is something mm. that draws them to the God of Israel. And yes, there might be some details they don't get right. We were talking last night in your hot tub about how China almost became a Christian country. They had accepted officially, the emperor had converted to Catholicism. Right? right, and um, and they would have eventually gone through a Protestant Reformation, just like Europe, probably. Right, um, they had officially converted to Catholicism, hundreds or tens of millions of Chinese, and the emperor, and then they had this ceremony, which is the, at the heart of Chinese culture, called Qingming, where they go to the graves of their ancestors and they bring offerings, and the Pope. Now, the Pope in the Vatican has all kinds of bones of dead saints. <laughs> right. So he writes a letter <laughs> to the Emperor of China and said, "I rebuke you." You have to renounce Qingming and stop celebrating your traditional ceremony or I'm going to excommunicate you. And the emperor of China said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do one better. I'm going to make Christianity, Christianity illegal. And it was illegal after that for hundreds of years to be a Catholic, a Protestant. Anything that had anything to do with Christianity was mm. completely illegal because uh, the Pope was trying to impose, but basically the Pope was the Torah police, right? And I'm not even saying the Pope was wrong. He should have applied it to himself, right? Meaning if it's some pagan thing where you're worshiping your ancestors, why yeah. does the Pope have all these bones in the Vatican of different saints that they're coming and burning incense to? Mm -hmm. But I, I believe what Malachi is saying is God is that big that he can accept the nations honoring his name even if they don't get all the details right. They're doing the best they can. You know what, you shouldn't be burning incense in a church in Iceland. You shouldn't be burning incense in a church. It should only be at the temple in Jerusalem, in a church in Sweden, in, in Germany. You should be doing it at the temple in Jerusalem, which has been destroyed, so you can't do it. But they were doing the best they could with what they had, and Malachi and the prophecy, the word of Yehovah, I think is, is acknowledging that, that the Gentiles are where they are, they're doing that, and that's why God is so amazing. He meets people where they are. That's what excites me so much about this. You know, I'll meet people, Michael, from all over the world. I met this woman in China. This was my first visit to China before I went to live there for a year, and I was in Beijing, and I'm talking to her through an interpreter, and she says to me, uh, she's part of a little house church, which has a very small number of people meeting in secret at the time, and she says, you know, I had this dream and I asked my house church what I should do. And they said, you need to go ask a Jew. And what was her dream? Her dream was she was told to keep the Torah. She was told to do the Torah. And she says to me through the interpreter, you're Jewish, can you tell me what the Torah is? And you have to understand, I had like three minutes to answer through an interpreter, which means wow. really like 30 seconds. I'm not sure I did as good a job as Yeshua would have done or Rabbi Hillel would have done. I did the best I could at the, under the circumstances, completely taken aback by the, by, the, by the question, not really, really fully knowing how to answer. Um, but we have this thing where God is doing something with people around the world. And maybe they don't fit my paradigm of the people God is supposed to be giving dreams to and, 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 and somehow interacting with, but they fit his paradigm, right? He's mm -hmm. willing to talk to the Gentile who burns incense in their temple. 
but who honors the name of Yehovah. That's how beautiful and wonderful this is. Uh, that's incredible. A revelation dream yeah. to keep the Torah and, and the, the people there say you need to speak to a Jew. And who shows up from halfway around the world? Right. You are the one that she asked. Incredible, right? So. And, and like I said, maybe I didn't do the be give the best answer. I gave the best I, I could. I, again, I, I, I bet you were the best one for the job or you wouldn't have been sent I, there. I did the best I could as Yehovah's humble servant. Um, and maybe next time I'd answer better. But uh, uh, the point is, here's a woman who literally didn't had no idea what I was talking, you know, what this dream was talking about, right? And this she, is a Chinese Christian, a Chinese house Christian church. in a house church in an underground church. She knows nothing what's going on. The internet is censored there. You can't go online and um, you know and, and just get. I mean, Google until recently was censored, and even the Google that's going in now is censored, right? Um, so you know they have their they're in their own sort of bubble and uh, have no idea what's going on in the outside world, no concept in many cases, and here she is having this dream, and, and my paradigm says, wait a minute, God doesn't talk to Christians, I'm a Jew. He's not supposed to talk <laughs> to people who don't have the same theology as me, who don't keep the same practices as me, who don't eat the same foods as me, yet she had that dream and, and came to me and said, help me, what, what does this mean? And I did the best I could to answer her, and now I understand with humility, that Yehovah can talk to anybody he wants to. He can do anything he wants to in the way he wants to. And, and wait, wait, and, wait, yeah. just that thing right there. Yeah. You know, the Christians of the world need to listen to this because mm. this applies directly to them because they would say the same thing about you. They God sure can't, yeah. you know, the Christians will say, oh, God can't talk to a Jew. Well, what do you mean about me? They say that about each other. Right. <laughs> if they're not in the right denomination, they'll say, God can't talk to a Catholic. God can't talk to a Baptist. God can't talk to a Lutheran. Hey, guys, let God be God. Let God talk to whoever and, 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 and inspire whoever he wants to inspire, because even those who are burning incense to his name in violation of the Torah, but are honoring his name the best they can. And, you know, maybe one day they'll come along and they'll understand what they're actually supposed to keep. Michael, I don't think we'll have time to get to it, but I want to have a conversation with you about the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, because I think this ties in directly to this issue. So I want to table that for a minute and get back later to Acts 15 if we can. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. I, I want to do that. Uh, tell, tell us uh, about this, because yeah. we, we actually have a- An authentic a, a, one, right? A, yeah, authentic one. This is from 1644, right. and give us the background okay. and how this relates to- so, America. Okay, so let me start with this. This is the, I hope people can see it, put up a graphic on the screen. Mm -hmm. This is the, the uh, silver round, one tri ounce of silver that I had produced at a mint in Utah. And it was based on these coins, which I had photos of from the internet um, from the 1640s. And it says, Eustus Eudix, righteous judge, referring to Psalm 9.5 and Jeremiah 11.20 and certain verses in the New Testament. And then in the middle it says, Yehovah, with the full vowels. On the back it says, my name is great among the nations, in Hebrew and English, Malachi 1.11. And um, I put this out and made this available to people. And we have a mutual friend, John, who heard about this. And he said, I'm going to go get a real one. <laughs> and he found on a European uh, bidding site, and I shouldn't say this because he wants to be the only one bidding for these things, and I think we just spoiled it for him, but in any event, he was able to get an authentic one, and he sent it off to NGC, which is the organization in America that authenticates coins to make sure that it was real, and he has it here encased. This is an authentic two-mark coin, um, which was the lower denomination, and this actually ties into the history of the United States in an incredible way, which I did not expect when I started looking at this and working on this. So, when the United States was founded, we did not have a currency, and the Continental Congress had this crisis. There were dozens of different coins being used throughout the 13 colonies, and they had to make a decision, okay, you merchant, do whatever you want. You decide to take uh, the currency from Sweden and the currency from, from Holland and the currency from wherever, and you do what you want, but the treasury of the United States has to have a standard of what currency they'll accept at what values. Well, today, if you want to know the value of a currency, you go online and you check the international, uh, international forex, the exchange rates, right, mm -hmm. which are constantly fluctuating. Well, it didn't work that way back then. The standard coin that was used throughout the colonies and really throughout much of the world was the Spanish uh, pilar or piece of eight. 
That was the standard coin, and that eventually became the, the, the U.S. dollar. But mm -hmm. we're talking 1776 before the Constitution. So they commissioned Thomas Jefferson to go study all the coins that were being used and decides which ones would be valid to be accepted as official currency in the United States, and he made a list. And the really cool thing here, Michael, is we, he made a handwritten list that was presented to the Continental Congress on September 2nd, 1776, right? So remember, July 4th, 1776 is Declaration of Independence. The Continental Congress is still meeting before, before there's a constitution, years before right. the constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the war is just is just gearing up the the war, war, American War of Independence, or as the British thought, the Rebellion. Um, September second, seventeen seventy six. This is approved by the Continental Congress. Listing of series of different currencies. And I can actually show the people here the wow. page in the actual handwriting of Thomas Jefferson. Michael, I read about this years ago, but as I was trying to produce this uh, replica of the coin in silver, I said, I wanna see the page for myself, what I read about years ago, and I found in the Library of Congress, they have this handwritten document approved by the Continental Congress, written by Thomas Jefferson, and it lists the different currencies, and you can actually see here at the top, it says uh, silver coins, it says the pilar, piece of eight, and that is the unit or dollar. And they're talking about the Spanish dollar, not the mm -hmm. US dollar, the Spanish mm -hmm. piece of eight. Mm -hmm. And it lists different coins. And it has here the English guinea and various other coins. And later on it says the, uh, the ducat of Holland, the ducat of Germany, the ducat of Sweden, and the ducat of Denmark. The Ducat of Denmark, one of the list of coins that was official currency in the United States when it was established as a nation, essentially even before it was fully established for the Constitution, was this coin, was this coin with the name of Yehovah on it. So this was true money accepted at the time as an equivalent in varying uh, 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 proportions to the Spanish dollar. And I mean, I read that and I'm like blown away. So here you have a king in Denmark. He doesn't know there's gonna be colonies 100 years later that will use his coin, but it becomes used in circulation and it's so recognizable that it becomes one of the coins used by merchants. And they say the ducat of Denmark, that's official currency. <laughs> that was September 2nd, which is exactly two months after we declared our independence from England, uh, which is two days before the Declaration of Independence, the document mm -hmm. was actually signed. But it was right. two months, July 2nd to September 2nd, and yeah. his name is made great among the nations. Among, and, and, and in this case, the founding of the nation, the founding of what I believe is the greatest democracy the world's ever seen. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this nation that, look, and I'll just speak from my very personal perspective as a Jew, you know, Jews were, you know, I call myself half jokingly the wandering Jew because in 2012, I left Israel and have been traveling around the world, teaching and preaching and doing all kinds of other things ever since. And, um, you know, sharing, sharing the word of God from the scriptures the best I know how, and I call myself joking the wan jokingly the wandering Jew, but where that joke comes from is that for 2,000 years my ancestors were wandering Jews. They would live in a country, get kicked out. Live in a country, get kicked out. Well, how do you kick someone out who's lived there for 200 years? Because you're Jews, you have no rights in this country. We're just mm -hmm. kicking you out, move on. And it wasn't until they came to the United States that finally Jews were accepted as full citizens and, and it's my hope and prayer that the United States doesn't become like other countries and say, you know, well, we're getting rid of our Jews. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope and pray. Um, I don't know. Some things I see in the news make me really nervous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that there's definitely some scary things going on. And, and quite frankly, well, I don't know if I should say this here. They're coming from one particular direction, and it's not the one the mainstream media is telling you. The anti-Semitism isn't coming from where the mainstream media is telling you. It's actually the opposite. It's almost like the mainstream media has become a smokescreen for what the real agenda is, this yeah. hatred mm -hmm. of Jews, which is masquerading as anti-Zionism, but it's really a form of anti-Semitism. Well, this nation was based on God-given rights, mm -hmm. and it is the God of Israel. Yes. That is the God-given rights, and this is what mm -hmm. our, our jurisprudence system, our legal system, is based on Torah law. Well, you know, Michael, it, it's really based on the fundamental, you know, people talk about the Judeo-Christian ethic. The fundamental principle, from my perspective, of the Judeo-Christian ethic is, it's in Genesis chapter one, where it says God created man in his image. And it says male and female, he created them. So this 
core principle that God made humankind consisting of male and female in the image of God. And by the way, that doesn't mean God has a big hook nose. It doesn't mean he has two arms with 10 fingers. When it says we're created in the image of God, that's speaking about our soul. We have a soul as humans, every human being, in a way that animals don't have. Mm-hmm. We have that intelligence that God has given us, that discernment. That's what it means to be born, to be created in the image of God. And, and, and this is the source of our, I mean, this is in, in, in U.S. constitutional law, they call this natural law. Right. And this mm-hmm. is the source of our rights. Our rights are not granted by a government. We right. do not get the right of free speech from the government in the United States. We get it from God. And the Constitution of the United States has done something that no other government before and very few since have acknowledged, which is our God-given right of free speech to defend ourselves and other rights. These are rights that come to us as the founders of the United States established from God himself. And because we are created in the image of God, Michael, I want to talk in, in, in the second half about the clash between those who love the name of Yehovah as represented in this coin and those in the Western civilization who have hated his name and what havoc that has wreaked. According to the Continental Congress, September 2nd, 1776, the name of the Almighty on the Denmark coin was official currency in the United States of America. But... It's not the only coin that has the name of the Almighty. Is that right, Nehemiah? Michael, it turns out that at this period in history, there were hundreds of coins and medals and uh, what's called jetons that were produced by kings and princes in, in particularly in Western Europe, Northwestern Europe, with the name of Jehovah on, the, on it. One of the most exciting of them to me, Michael, is this uh, commemorative uh, silver medal coin that was produced Uh, after what was called the Peace of Westphalia. Now, for our audience, if you haven't heard of the Peace of Westphalia, if you know any peace treaty in history, this is probably the most important peace treaty for Western civilization. What had happened is the Protestant Reformation begins uh, in October 1517. Martin Luther, he he nails the 95 Theses to the uh, church in Wittenberg, and then all hell breaks loose. The Protestants and Catholic Catholic countries go to war, and they fight for over a hundred years. Some historians say that as many as half of Europeans were killed in this war. Hmm. I mean, this war went on. One, there was actually several sub wars. One was called the Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War. But this went on really for over a hundred years. This killing back and forth. It was a disaster. It was really the equivalent of World War One of the time, right? Hmm. But for Europe. And at the end of this, of this just bloodbath of killing each other over being Catholic and Protestant and Calvinist and Lutheran, right? It was all kinds of people killing all kinds of other people over religion. They get together in a place called Westphalia and they hammer out a peace treaty. And one of the central principles of Western civilization is in this peace treaty. I mean, really, in a sense, this is the beginning of the modern world, the peace of Westphalia, because it establishes, the Europeans establish, we will never go to war over religion again. They say the wars of religion are over, and there's this beautiful coin. I'm, I, we can show the people here what it looks like. This beautiful silver coin produced to commemorate the Peace of Westphalia, and you see three hands coming together representing the friendship and peace of the European powers. And what do we see at the top of this coin? In whose name and under whose auspices do they make this peace? Under the name Yehovah in Hebrew, with the full vowels, Yehovah. And Incredible. It, and it's essentially the equivalent of what we would say today, I'm gonna swear on a stack of Bibles. The European powers minting this mm, coin mm. were saying, we're not gonna fight over religion again. And I gotta say, the Europeans have been pretty good about it. There have been a few exceptions. Famously, in, in Ireland, there were, there were what they call the Troubles, and there were wars in, in uh, Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, over religion. But other than that, Think about that twice, and the war's over other things, right? But specifically over religious sectarianism, there has not been a major war in Europe for 400 years. That's a, that's a really big deal. Um, you know, some people have said that, you know, uh, oh boy, I don't know if I should go into this politics the side of it, but there's another religion out there that, that is carrying out wars and killing people left and right. 
uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the last few years. Mm -hmm. and, and it's often said, well, they're unique and uniquely warlike people, uniquely warlike religion. And, and as somebody who studies history, I'm not convinced of that. I just think they haven't matured to the point where they've had their peace of Westphalia. So this really is the foundation of Western civilization, of, mo of the modern world, that we can say, look, we can disagree, we can have dis you know, dis you know, misunderstandings, we can dislike each other, but we're not gonna go to war over whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, and it took them a little bit longer for the Jews to be included in that, right? But it was a good start, okay? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. eventually it did include the Jews, yeah. and it was done under the, under the name of Yehovah. And Michael, this to me is, is such a powerful symbol, this, this coin with Yehovah's name on it, because it represents, like I said, hundreds of coins in Europe that were made at this time, in this period, over a period of several hundred years with Yehovah's name. But there's another, another spirit in Europe at the time, and this other spirit is something we actually see in the writings of Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther started out when he, uh, uh, his reformation against the Catholic Church, and he loved the Jews. But within a period of about 10 years, he turned against the Jews when he saw he wasn't successful in converting them to Lutheranism and hated them with just a vicious hatred. And part of hating the Jews was hating the name of the God of the Jews. Mm. I learned about mm. this, Michael, a few years ago. Uh, it, was, it was the 500th anniversary in 2017 of Martin Luther's 500 theses, uh, 95 theses. <laughs> and, and I was speaking to these, this, this uh, um, fellowship of Protestants and Catholics who were coming together to, to try to hash this out and what it meant for them. And one of the things they told me about is something I'd never really heard about before, which is the Judensau. The Judensau is this um, motif in European art if you can call it art. Um, and it's the opposite of the motif in European art that has the name of Yehovah in the clouds with light coming to the world from, from, from his name. So the Judensau is a pig, a female pig. And, and let, me, let me read you how Martin Luther himself describes this in 1543. Yeah, I, I've seen that image, but I'm I did not- I'm actually gonna show it to uh, the people here. Okay, uh, I did not uh, see this inscription. I had so, no idea how Martin Luther was handling this thing. Right. And we know that, that Martin Luther, he killed, he, he drowned 200 Anabaptists because, you know, oh, really? we have to, have to face it, mm -hmm. he, he didn't die as a Lutheran. Luther died as a Catholic priest. Really? And, and sprinkling was the way that the Catholics did baptism. <laughs> well, the Anabaptists, they were, uh, they were convinced in immersion as, mm. as uh, you know, the, okay. the Hebrew mikvah. And they yeah. were convinced of that and he literally drowned them. He killed over 200 wow. of them. Wow. And then he comes after the, and so what you read uh, from Martin Luther, it, it's shocking, but it doesn't surprise me knowing his background. Now, what the people can see here is uh, a Judensau, and not just any Judensau. This is a statue, a carving that's actually in the church where Martin Luther was a pastor. There were there were two major churches in Wittenberg at the time. The one, the cathedral where he he uh, hammered the ninety five theses to, and the other church where he was the pastor. And in the right. other church, there right. was- Right, he nailed the theses on the church that he wasn't the pastor of. Right, well, I guess they didn't <laughs> accept him there. Um, but, and this, statue wasn't built by Martin Luther. It had been there for about 200 years at the time. And he describes it in his book, and I'll tell you later the name of the book written in 1543. He says, here on our church in Wittenberg, a sow, meaning a female pig, is sculpted in stone. Young pigs and Jews lie suckling under her, meaning they're suckling at the teats of a pig. Be, I mean, nothing could be more offensive to a Jew. Right. I, I mean, yeah. think about it. Uh, for a Jew, who the, the pig is a symbol for the Jew of persecution, of suffering, of being murdered by the Greeks in, in, in the time of the Maccabees, of Hanukkah. Yeah, and, so, and Tychus. So, uh, I mean, you yeah. could go to secular Jews today in Israel who don't believe in God, and most of them still won't eat pig. And if you ask them why, they say, this is the symbol of our people being murdered. Mm -hmm. Right? They might eat shellfish because they're not religious and don't believe in God. But most Jews in Israel that I know who are even secular won't even won't eat a pig. And here they're portraying Jews as suckling from the teats of a pig. He says, behind the sow, a rabbi is bent over the sow, lifting up her right leg, holding her tail high and looking intensely under her tail and, in, and into her Talmud. And, and guys, you can see here in the image, when he says under her tail, he's looking inside the intestines of the pig. I'll use that euphemism. 
you get the point. And then it says, as though he were reading something acute or extraordinary. This is the rabbi looking inside the intestines of the pig, which is certainly where they get their Shem HaMifurash. Michael, Shem HaMifurash is the Hebrew phrase. Shem means name and HaMifurash means the explicit. Shem HaMifurash is what Jews and Hebrew call the Tetragrammaton. It's what we call the name Yehovah. The name Yehovah in Hebrew is referred to as Shem HaMifurash. And at the top of the Judensau, this isn't just Martin Luther's opinion, it actually says in German, Shem HaMifurash, the explicit name. Uh-huh. So here Martin Luther Talk is about talking about, I mean, at the same time there are European princes fighting over this name, fighting under the banner of the name, let's put it that way, and putting it on their coins and honoring it. At that very same time in history, you have Martin Luther, who maybe doesn't even fully understand what he's saying, calling the name Yehovah something read out of the intestines of a pig by a rabbi. I mean, nothing could be more offensive to me as a Jew. Yeah. This beautiful, honored, honorable, glorious name of Yehovah, and he's saying that, the, the, yeah, the Jews know what that is, because they read it out of the pig's intestines. Yeah. And, and you know, I gotta say, Michael. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go well, ahead. Well, I go gotta ahead. say, I, I did the study, 10 rabbis speak out on the name, and I show that there's 10, and now even more, 19 rabbis out of this recording, who say that the vowels are Yehovah, this is the name of the creator of the universe and the, and the true pronunciation. Some of them say that's what it was in the temple, and others say that's what it will be when, when the Messiah comes. Uh, it will mean the messianic era in the kingdom, that it will be pronounced as Yehovah. We have these rabbis saying this, and then there's this spirit against that name, the spirit of Martin Luther, who says that comes from the Jewish Talmud. We don't trust that from the Jewish sources. We don't trust this name from the Jewish manuscripts. It's the Judensau spirit. It's the spirit to uh, demonize the Jews. I mean, literally in many cases. Uh, I mean, to, to present Yehovah's name as this abomination when really it's the glorious name that was prophesied about in Malachi that would be great among the nations, the name that would be honored throughout the nations that would, I mean, there's the verse in Amos 9 that maybe we'll get to in the next, in, in the next episode. I want to talk about that because because that, re- can, can I bring it now real quick, Amos 9? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we, just, we, it just go, go ahead. It, it just hits me that 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 uh, for anyone now with understanding that mm. who would ever want to call themselves a Lutheran, understand well, the the background look, of what was going on. I don't want to knock Lutherans because the Lutheran World Federation, their official body in the 1970s, apologized for the anti-Semitism of Martin Luther. Openly said, we acknowledge. I'm paraphrasing their words, but my understanding of what they said is we acknowledge that what Martin Luther taught, because he wrote a book called The Jews and Their Lies, right. mm-hmm. and he set out a 10-point plan there that was then implemented by the Nazis. So the Lutheran World Federation did some soul searching, and they said, we have to denounce the anti-Semitism of Martin Luther. He's our founder. We agree with the basic principle that he was teaching, but whatever he taught about the Jews, we denounce that. So I want to give them credit for that. Okay, and that. all right. But here's the prophecy of Amos 9:11. It says, "By Yom Hahu on that day, Akimet Sukkot David Hanofelet, I will raise up the fallen tabernacle of David." And I'm going to let you talk about that. I'm going to let oh, you're going to let me wow. talk about that next time. <laughs> okay. uh, but I'm, I'm going to try right. to hold you back because I want to get to something else here. Okay, all right. The Gadalti at Pirzehen, and I will. Uh, Fence in the broken uh, breaches, vaharisotava kim, and its ruins I will raise up. Ubinitia kime olam, and I will I will build her as the days of old. Leman yirshuot sheirit adom v'chol agoyim. In order, here's what it literally says in Hebrew. This is quoted in Acts, and we'll talk about that ne- next. Maybe we can start talking about it now. I don't know. Leman yirshuot sheirit adom v'chol agoyim. Literally, in order that they will inherit the remnant of Edom and all the nations. Asher nikrash mi'alehem, that my name is called upon them, says Yehovah who, will, who does this. So here we have a prophecy of the nations who are being absorbed into Israel, right? The word there is inherit, right? And some Jews have misunderstood this and said there's gonna, they're going to be conquered. No, 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 no. They're going to be absorbed into, grafted in. They're grafted gonna, you know, in. The word in is mm-hmm. v'nivrechu in Genesis. We can talk about that if we have time. They're going to be absorbed into Israel, into the covenant with God. 
Adam and all the nations that my name is called upon them. And here we have the coin of King Christian IV and hundreds of other coins produced by Europeans in this period throughout Europe, even in some Catholic countries. I, I had somebody who went to the, uh, a number of people who went to the, um, the Palace of Versailles and came back and showed me, look, Yehovah's name is in the chapel at the Palace of Versailles, That's right. which was yeah. a Catholic country at the time, mm -hmm. right? So it wasn't just Protestants. It, were pe it was people who were searching for the God of Israel the best they could and the best they knew how, offering incense, doing what they knew how to do, and Yehovah refers to those people as the nations that my name is called upon them. They will be absorbed into his covenant, into his people, according to Amos. I mean, yes, it's quoted in the New Testament, but Amos says it. This is a Tanakh message, that this is a message for all mankind. And I feel like we have to jump to... To, to Acts 15 and, and, and talk about the context oh, here. Oh, okay. Because there's well, so many things, uh, places, uh, directions I want to go with this, uh, <laughs> and we don't even have time to. to uh, uh, all right, but but we, we have to say something here. Yeah, I have to yeah, say please. something uh, because uh, what we're going to do at Passover, the opening of Passover, what we're going to do is get into uh, the uh, discovery you made in the elephantine. Papyri, 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 right, right, right. Guys, I discovered, and I'm getting so excited, I'm shaking, talk, thinking, just, you know, you, you brought this up. And, and look, it wasn't actually my discovery. It was buried in this journal article that some professor had written in the 1960s. And I happened to, I just ran into this professor somewhere and was talking with him. And he just in passing mentions that there were Gentiles 2,500 years ago who were living according to the Torah, keeping Shabbat. And I said, what? What? <laughs> what? Is this your opinion? Is this your theory? Because professors do that. They have opinions and theories. He said, no, it's written in a papyrus. Oh, okay, now, all right. I'm going to have you do this. We're going to do this for the opening of Passover this year. We can okay? share this actual yeah, information. Yeah, actually show that very stuff. That, that, that you, We talked about this a few months ago. When you told me this, it was like, uh, you know, this is, this is breaking, this is breaking, because this is an ancient prophecy mm -hmm. come to pass, and, and you actually are going to show how 200 years after Isaiah prophesies this, mm. this is actually what's taking place, and you say you have the archeological evidence of this we very thing. We have it written on papyrus from ancient Egypt, we can show you the documents. We can show. I mean, okay, we, I mean, we're going to wait, wait for Passover because we've got a lot more that we're going to do at Passover. We're going to do some of the stuff in the Gospel. Uh, oh, don't tell them. Don't, don't tell okay. them. Okay. All right. We're, we're, all right. We're, we're, we're go. Gonna, go we're back. Gonna, we're going to share something really exciting. Something we've been working on. All right. And, we, we, and, and I really want to share it for Passover. Look, the reason I want to share it for Passover is really because. You know, this is what happens sometimes it is, you know, we'll, we'll share a little tidbit because, hey, we're running out of time here in this episode yeah. and people will take it out of context and misunderstand it. And I feel this is such an important discovery that mm -hmm. we're going to share at Passover. It really is an important discovery, especially for your ministry, Michael, and the things you've been teaching. Um, but I think for anybody who, who really wants to understand what it's going to be about, I can't tell them, um, that it ha we really need to lay out all the evidence. Because if we just give them a tidbit, I guarantee you that people are going to take it out of context. And so if we lay out all the evidence, we're going to build a solid case and put it in context. And then people can say whatever they want. Opinion will be left out of it, right? And, and right, look, there's always right. a certain element of these things where you have to decide for yourself. This is my motto. Michael is a Karite Jew. Search well in the scripture and do not blindly rely on anyone's opinion. So what we've done is we've put together a team of an international team of people who are searching on the specific topic in the Gospels. In I can't even say more. And and, oh, okay. and we're going to yeah. present right. the evidence to people, and they can decide for themselves. And, and, this this and, stuff, oh. manuscripts have been hidden for <laughs> hundreds of years, and now you're, you're going to present this. Michael, they weren't just hidden for hundreds of years. I, I, I feel like I can't even hold it back. I, I, th you th have to. There was literally a manuscript that was locked. There was Access was not available, and within a very short period of time, it was unlocked. Like literally there was a symbol of a padlock and they said, you can't access this. And within three hours we had access to the manuscript. I can't go into any more of it. 
Uh, it's exciting stuff. I'm, we're going to stay it for Pesach. Okay. But I want to end with Isaiah 56 because we're really running out of time here. Okay. Isaiah 56 is, is one of my favorite passages. I've preached on it many times. But listen how relevant this is to Amos 9 and to... Um, now and what we're this, gonna get and, into in the, the book of Acts. And in this coin, right, and to Acts 15 and Acts 21, what we're gonna get into next time, hopefully, but into this coin, the king, he puts the name of Yehovah. In Isaiah 56, it says, I will bring them to my holy mountain, and I will make them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their peace offerings will be accepted upon my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's verse seven. That's all most people ever read. But let's read verse six. And the sons of the Gentiles who join themselves to Yehovah to serve him. We'll talk more about what that means, sons of Gentiles, next time. If, if we, okay, can we, yeah, can we do we, that? I to, but here's the key for me. Ule'ahava et shame Yehovah. And to love the name of Yehovah. To be his servants. So here was this king in Denmark. And he only knew what he knew. He was raised in the Lutheran church, coming out of the Catholic church. And he didn't fully even understand it. But he had this burning love for the God of Israel and for the name of Yehovah. And he put it on his coin to show, I don't know what it is. I don't fully understand it. But in my heart, this name burns and I want the whole world to know it. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a fulfillment of prophecy that we can see unfolding before us in the record of history. Well, Naomi, will you close with putting the name on the people? Absolutely. Yehovah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come and share this with the people, to learn about how your name was glorified among the nations. Yevarechecha Yehovah v'yishmerecha, Ye'er Yehovah panav elecha v'yichuneka, Yisa Yehovah panav elecha, V'yasem lecha shalom, May Yehovah give you peace. Amen. Amen. Well, the adventure has just begun. We're going to ramp this thing up and the whole Passover weekend is going to be a time of great discovery. But until then, Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov, have a good week and we'll see you back here for a little bit more of the story before Passover on Shabbat Night Live.